Okay, welcome everyone. We are recording. Thank you to all of those who could join us today for our Thriving the Dissertation Seminar session with Dr. Gunjiri. We're very excited to have her with us to present on the topic from dissertation to publication. And just a little bit about Dr. Gunjiri for those who may not be aware. Uh, she previously served as a faculty member with Eastern University's PhD program in organizational leadership. She was with the Eastern program from 2008 to 2013, and she's a leadership and organization development consultant. She's also an adjunct dissertation chair at Abilene Christian University. She's published on a range of topics that focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, women in leadership, collaborative autoethnography and spirituality in organizations. She's co-authored several more and most recently co-edited African Leadership, Powerful Paradigms for the 21st Century. Her dissertation also won the Exemplary Dissertation Award from the ERA Division A or Administration, Organization and Leadership. So congratulations. Um, so uh, just an amazing scholar and practitioner and in incredible leader. And we're thrilled that she's here with us to talk a bit about how you go from dissertation to publication. And so with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Gunjiri. Thank you and welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so very much. And congratulations to the two freshly minted PhDs in the room. It is um, wonderful to have you in this space and to welcome you into the academy. Um, uh, I know about uh, uh, Mary because we follow each other on LinkedIn and, and on uh, <laughs> Facebook. And, you know, so I know when she defended. Um, it's wonderful when, when um, even if I'm not your, I'm not in the program, I'm not your um, faculty, observing your, when you join the program, when you, you know, when you're going to those conferences, there's something very exciting about seeing that process, even from a distance. Um, so I, I was proud as Siva had been associated with, <laughs> with her, even though I wasn't. Um, so yes, we're talking about thriving the dissertation seminar with three people who've already successfully gotten through their dissertations. So I don't want this to be just me talking. I do want to have a conversation, have a dialogue. And so I'm going to ask um, everyone in the room one by one, tell me, have you already had a publication? You can start with Karen, because even though I already know your answer, but have, have you already published something related to your research work? Yes. Yes, I, I had the opportunity to publish a chapter in a book collection. All right. And Mary, have you had a, have you published something in the last, in the time that you've been part of the program? Uh, no, I have not. But you've done conference presentations. I've done numerous conference presentations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And several, mm -hmm. several of those are based um, along the research that I did for my dissertation. All right. And Brenda, have you published yet? No, not yet. And have you done conference presentations? Yes. Okay. But not not necessarily. Oh, sorry. Huh? No, that's okay. Go ahead. You can go to the next person. No, you were going to say not necessarily related to your right. dissertation? Right. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. Okay. And Karen? Uh, How do you not, say your last name? Odokara? Odokara? Odokara, yes. Odokara. Uh, Mary and I were actually working together on an article that uh, <laughs> didn't make it all the way through and we got uh, sidetracked to work on our own dissertations, but I have done conference presentations both on that research as well as my own dissertation. Okay. And uh, Alicia? 
Yes, uh, I actually. I haven't have seen not. your face. Do you do you mind showing us your face for just a second so I feel like oh. I know who I'm talking to? <laughs> <laughs> well, I um I am not prepared for that today, but <laughs> um I I mean I can do a short clip and say hi to everybody. I'm on my phone, so can you see me? That's good enough. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yes. So I recently finished my dissertation in December. I am looking okay. to uh, publish and I have um, presented in, in a conference. Okay, thank you. And uh, Paul, it says Paul at Eastern University. Unmute, we haven't met. <laughs> All right, well, Paul figures out, uh, there you go. I can see you talking, but I don't hear you. Maybe your audio is a bit um, off. How about now? Now we can, can hear you. Hear you. Yeah, that, yep. that's the second time in my life I was been told that someone couldn't hear me. <laughs> I was having I was having earbud problems, but I think I'm fixed. Oh, okay, yeah, that happens. That happens. So I was asking about publications. Are you in the Eastern program? Yes, ma'am. I, okay. I only have one. I'm in. Um, I finished my comps uh, two months ago, three months. Ago. I don't remember. It was traumatic, mm -hmm. so I forgot it. But I, I passed <laughs> my comps, and um, and I think I think uh, if I finish the last piece, then uh, this August or September we become candidates and we start working on our dissertation. Yeah, I have one right. publication. You have one publication. Is it related to what you're thinking of doing for your dissertation? I hate to say this out loud, but I'm going to. I don't know what I'm going to do for my dissertation. Um, Every course I take, I learn something I didn't know before that changes the direction in my thought. Um, so uh, I'm going to wait until I'm done with this semester and then uh, let my uh, advisor and I uh, come to a conclusion. I've discovered okay. most of my previous conclusions were wrong. <laughs> so. It's good to have an open mind, you know. Um, it is perfectly fine to have an open mind to sort of wait for things to fall into place. Um, all right, so what I'm gonna talk about will sound familiar then, um, based on the, the prior experiences that you all have had with uh, conferencing and dissertation and those who have survived the dissertation process and everything in between. Um, so I um, start from asking the question of why should we publish our work, right? Um, especially if, you're not looking to become a tenure track um, faculty member at some institution when you're done with the program, right? Because not everybody who's doing a PhD in leadership necessarily wants to go into full-time tenure track positions. So even if that's not your goal, um, you should still disseminate your work. And my argument is that why spend two years, three years working on something only for it to gather dust in a library somewhere, right? Publishing is how we share what we have learned with the world, right? What we have learned through our research. And your dissertation is your sweat, your blood, and your tears. So you better let it serve you and serve the world, right? Um, so that's not a very scholarly reason for, for saying we should publish um, your blood, sweat, and tears, but really, if you have invested that much time, that much effort, that much resources in creating this document, right? Then it is only right that it should be shared with the world, not just with the dissertation committee, not just with the people who attend your um, you know, defense meeting. No, it needs to be shared with the world. It deserves to be shared with the world. And we always say that in the in PhD programs, really, we're, we're 
participating, we're joining a discipline, right? So it's really important that the things that you're producing end up contributing to the discipline. So as a precursor then, I um, believe that attending conferences and presenting your work there, that's a good soft first step, right? Um, in, in disseminating knowledge. And even if you haven't done it for your dissertation yet, if you have done it for some work you have done in the past, even if it was a, you know, uh, a final uh, output of one of your courses that you ended up you know, um, taking to a conference and it got accepted and you're able to engage with people, that process is part of learning this discipline of becoming not just lifelong learners, but keepers of the discipline. Because again, that's a, a term we use when we're talking about, you know, the doctoral process. You are becoming a keeper of the discipline. So conferences will provide you, as you have noticed, for those of you who have participated in conferences, it's a ready audience and a safe peer review, right? Because when we're doing conferences, um, we tend to be a little bit gentler than we are. I say this with shame. Um, the peer review post process for articles can be brutal, right? People can say all manner of things because they are behind the shield of anonymous peer review, right? But in a conference where you're sitting facing one another, you're sitting around the table or you're presenting in front and your, your audience is engaging with you, we do tend to be a little bit gentler. So conferences help you to sharpen your ideas and your thoughts and to learn from your peers and even the more experienced scholars and practitioners who would be present at, at the conferences. And in this, this particular idea, I, you know, I wrote it before I had a conversation with Karen, but really she just shared with me that that's exactly what happened. So at some point I'm gonna ask her to share that experience. So do not underestimate the power of presenting at conferences. Okay, do not underestimate the power of presenting at conferences. It can be expensive because, you know, you're probably paying for yourself to go to those conferences, you're paying for the hotel, you're paying for, for the transport and all that. You're paying, you might even be paying for registration, but it is worth every penny. It is part of that doctoral learning. It is part of that becoming key part of the discipline and if you end up going into you know if you're already in teaching or you you will end up in teaching then it's part of that discipline as well the discipline of being a scholar practitioner so stepping forward beyond that um you know you begin by using that feedback that you receive from the conferences to fine-tune your work before you send it out for publications Conferences can and often are also sources for publication opportunities. The number of opportunities that I have participated in by being at the International Leadership Association or by being at the Academy of Management, the two conferences I normally attend, those in the nonprofit world, it could be a NOVA, those in, in um, higher ed administration or student affairs, it could be NASPA, right? Networking, giving and receiving feedback joining with others, right? You get invited to submit, you get invited to co-author, you get invited to co-edit, right? But being in these spaces with other students, other um, faculty, other practitioners from, it could be from your region or it could be from around the world, right? Depending on whether you're in a small local conference um, or you're in an international conference like ILA and AOM. So this is how, um, um, for me, I got to, to participate in publishing books on women and, and leadership through my participation in ILA, right? So Women as Global Leaders that I co-edited with Susan Madsen, uh, Women and Leadership Around the World that I co-edited with Susan Madsen, Karen Longman, and Cynthia Cherry, um, all through ILA and we co-edited seven volumes. Well, we, we edited a series of seven volumes and we directly co-edited two of those. So it is definitely a way to, to find those opportunities because you know they won't generally um, necessarily fall on your lap while you're, you're at your desk doing your homework, right? Or you know reading your books or preparing for your classes. 
They will do that after you have met those people in those conferences. I've also participated in special issues like at um, advances, advancing, uh, advances for developing human, re human, uh, ADHR, human resources. Um, I don't think that's the journal. It might be AD, ADRE, anyway, whatever. It's a HRD journal. Yeah, AD, HRD, whatever. We did a special issue on authentic leadership, right? Um, again, that was through engagement with uh, other, um, other people at ILA. Uh, I've co-edited volumes based religious, like religious diversity in the workplace, special issues of journals through colleagues I met through academic management. So the, 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 the general scenario can be something like you present a paper on a topic you're interested in that you've been working on. Um, and when you, when you submit to ILA or AOM or any of those conferences, you might, present, you might submit as an individual, or maybe there's two, three of you pre, um, participating, writing the thing together. But when it goes there, it gets put together with other papers of similar topics. So you might end up with four to six um, you know, presentations in a session. And then the conversations continue from there. And it's like, yeah, let's take this to the next level, right? So it could be an edited book from there, or it could be you know, a special issue of a journal. And that's a gentler way to get into publishing. Again, uh, in comparison to cold, you know, like cold calling, but cold sending, you know, when you just go to the journal, find a journal and figure out whether it publishes, you know, things in your area and then you just send something, that doesn't work quite as well um, as it does when you've gone in as a special issue. And then as you become more and more known for your topic for, you know, publishing in, in, in uh, special issues or book chapters, then it is that much easier to get published even in journals where you don't actually know people because they'll recognize your name, right? They'll see you and they say, oh yeah, I see, I've, I've seen some, some of her work in this other journal or I've seen her presenting at this other place. So you become a known element. Let me tell you, even though we think of blind review and all that stuff, there's still people who, it still has to go through an editor, right? So the editor can decide whether to even send it for that peer review or not. So being a familiar name by virtue of something else you've done before definitely comes in handy. So I think of dissertation as, as I said low hanging fruit, but really what I mean is that it's available and it's accessible, right? Your traditional dissertation, that five chapters that you work on can produce for you at least three articles and possibly a book. Um, when you look at your five chapter dissertation, you're thinking about the conceptual, right? The conceptual framing as chapter one. And you're, you have to write that theoretical framing, which is the chapter two, you know, your literature review. Then you write a, method, a methods chapter. And then you have, you know, your, your results chapter and your discussion chapter. You can be able to take that five dissertation, five chapter dissertation and produce at least three articles. One could be based on your chapter one where you were writing just conceptually, right? And the other two could be, it could be from the methods or it could be derived from your results, right? Because your results, you're likely to have if it's quantitative, it's possible it might be just one article. It's possible if it's a short thing. But in many cases, we are able to split those things up. You know, you split certain variables, even with a quantitative study, and publish them in, the, in different avenues. So as I was thinking through this, I started to, to look at some of the things I was able to publish out of my dissertation. Some of these are not groundbreaking in any way, shape, or form, right? They were easy to get into opportunities. My first one, I was still a doctoral student, as I was collecting um, my data and, and, and um, you know, thinking through my, my, what was coming up, I published a piece on spirituality and leadership in action 
which was about how women in um, the circle of concerned women theologians, which is a, a Pan-African organization um, of women theologians who got together to come up with a theological response to the HIV and AIDS crisis. So I was talking about how they're bringing, you know, the Bible to bear, right, on the church's response to HIV and AIDS. So I published that in a journal that's called The Other Journal, which is an online, um, I don't know whether it even still exists, but it was an online journal. And that's a gentle, that's an easy, you know, place to start to put your stuff out there. And then when I finished my dissertation, one of the chapters I did, one of the, on the from chapter three, which is the methods chapter, but also from, um, thinking through how the process that I used, the methods that I used, how that whole process impacted me. That resulted in a, in a journal article on painting a counter narrative of African woman who reflections on how my research transformed me in a peer reviewed um, online journal called Journal Research Practice, um, which um, does not publish anymore. It's, it was closed a few years ago. Um, but it was a very good place for publishing um, research related, methods related uh, publications. So the, obviously all that stuff is still out there online. They're just not publishing new, um, new issues. Then Banking on Women was a chapter I wrote about um, how one of the participants in my study, mine was qualitative, um, how she was um, she had, she was leading this organization that was uh, um, lending, giving credit to women, because for many years in Kenya, women could not access loans from the national and international banks. Um, so she was a pioneer in, in um, you know, servicing women. And if you've heard of Grameen Bank, the, the Kenya Women's Finance Trust was like the Grameen Bank of Kenya, right? Um, then Rocking the Boat was another piece that I, I, I wrote that was, again, a short piece that was just talking about women as tempered radicals, one of the, the subtopics of my dissertation. So all these pieces, um, as I was writing them, some of them I started writing when I was still working on the dissertation, Many of them I did after I completed the dissertation. But what, what was interesting was um, painting a counter narrative started as a, as a conference presentation. Banking on women started as a conference presentation at Academy of Management when uh, a session on um, the bottom of the pyramid, right? Rocking the boat was a conference presentation at University Council for, Council for Education Administration conference. Uh, corruption and the feminization of, of, of poverty started as a as a article, I mean, as a presentation that I did at African Studies Association. Southern Leadership and Motherhood was a, uh, started as a conference presentation at a, a National Communication Association conference. So basically what I'm trying to show you is practically how this looked like for me, right? This process of um, you know, taking bits and pieces of your of the work that you're doing, of the, of the dissertation that you're working on, and presenting it at conferences, and how that could lead to opportunities to to uh, publish. Okay, so each of these began its life as a conference presentation. I actually started presenting on my dissertation um, before I even defended it. So in two thousand five while I was still analyzing data and writing my chapters, I was presenting at conferences. Each chapter was presented at a conference before it was finalized. And the feedback I received was very helpful in me finalizing my writing, right? And then eventually, obviously, sending them off for these publications. So as I mentioned, some of those early publications, they're not masterpieces, right? And that may be true of you that some of your early publications wouldn't necessarily be your, you know, um, your masterpiece because it is about practice. It is about putting your, your, you know, dipping your toes in that water, 
right? But you get better and better and better with time. The fact that I received feedback on all these various elements as I was working on them is probably why the dissertation did end up winning an award at American Educational Research Association, right? Because it, I wasn't only getting feedback from my committee, I was also getting feedback from people who knew a lot more about my, you know, the, the topic of women and leadership than I did, from people who may have known about my context, from people who were just curious and were asking really good questions. So it really helped me to write a great dissertation, which then eventually, when I was done playing around with all these presenting here and you know um, publishing a chapter there and publishing a, 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 a paper here, eventually then I put together a book and that was published in 2010. So from 2005 to 2010, I had managed to produce quite a lot out of that dissertation. What's funny is that while I was doing all that, um, while well, I was still in, you know, walking through my, my ideas in grad school, I had a professor tell me that if I worked on the topic I was interested in, which was, you know, women and leadership in, in Africa, nobody would ever publish my work. By the time I graduated, I was already starting to prove him wrong, right? By being able to present, by getting those opportunities to, to send my work out. Obviously, from the moment when you start uh, the process, you know, sending your, your piece to a journal to the moment it comes out could be anywhere from one year to two years, right? So by the time I was publishing the book, I had definitely proven him wrong, that indeed my topic could get and did get published um, a lot, a lot. So the risk is that some of the peer reviews you get, <laughs> they can be really brutal, but uh, what I say about that is feel bad, okay? You're entitled to feel bad, emote, okay? But emote and then move on, keep it moving. If one outlet does not accept it, look at the feedback, figure out which part of it, that feedback is actually useful, right? Um, there are times when you get feedback that is not really useful because again, people can be very brutal, but many times, even when you get a rejection, you get some thorough feedback. So use that feedback and then send it somewhere else, right? Don't put it away and forget about it. The reward is that once you get through that whole peer review process, you'll be so proud of seeing your name in print and knowing that your work is going to bless someone out there. For me, one of the things that, that um, is a favorite, like when I go to, to ILA, I went to ILA after missing a year and then I went the next year and I met all these students um, from other institutions who were you know, telling me about how my work was providing the foundation for their own dissertations. Or I meet someone who's like, oh my goodness, I read your book, right? And it's like, wow, that blesses me because I know that people out there are using the, the, the material put out there to work on their own, to support their own thinking. It is really quite rewarding. It is not rewarding on your pocket, I will not lie. The amount of books and, and things are published, if I was getting paid market rate for them, uh, I would be a rich woman. But it is fulfilling. It is eternally fulfilling. So what am I saying? If I was to diagram what I'm, I've been talking about is that you can have those term papers, those conceptual papers that you're working on before your dissertation, those conference presentations. You take the dissertation itself, for those of you who have completed them, right? You break it up into conference papers, into workshops, into round table conversations. Eventually, as you work on that process of sharing your work, of, of engaging with, with peers, of engaging with you know, um, more seasoned um, professional colleagues, then you get into these, these um, opportunities to, to publish as journal articles in special issues or journal articles in general issues. So it doesn't, you know, the, it doesn't even have to be a special issue as long as the journal publishes your topic, you can always send that out. It can be book chapters and eventually even, you know, taking that whole dissertation and transforming it into a book. Uh, two of my students from Eastern um, 
Maggie Madibo and Priscilla Dobu, both of them got to publish their, their um, dissertations as books in a series that I facilitate for um, Palgrave. Right, so once they had finished, they'd done presentations in conferences. We went to a few ILA conferences. Um, then they, they were able to transform because you can't take it and just plonk it into a book. The dissertation is very redundant. So there's some rewriting involved, removing some of the you know repetition that you find in dissertations. But they they were able to publish those books, and now those books are more readily available, um, especially here in the African market, than the journal articles would be behind a paywall. Okay, so it is, is very very doable, very very possible, and I highly, highly recommend it. The thing to do is to make sure that you're working with a mentor, you're working with a more seasoned colleague to be able to produce these materials, right? The, when I say that, you know, a lot of those things I published at the beginning were not really, um, you know, um, they were not, they cannot be described as masterpieces. A lot of those early pieces that I worked on, I was working on them by myself, right? It wasn't, um, my, my chair from my doctoral program wasn't um, necessarily helping me at that point. Um, and so I was figuring it out on my own. Um, but eventually I got it and, you know, I started to do much better publications in much better, more scholarly, more reputable journals like, you know, um, those sage publications, um, advances in developing human resources, general management, spirituality and religion, in um, general of, uh, business communication, um, um, yeah, and several other journals like that, you know, high quality academic journals. But I still am very proud of these early pieces because they're not behind a paywall, okay? So any um, student out here in Africa who's Googling and trying to find something on women and leadership, they're more likely to find these earlier pieces that are not behind a paywall than they are to find journals behind a Rutledge or Sage or Emerald paywall. So I'm still, you know, I'm still glad that some of my work ended up in those outlets. So, that's what I have for you tonight. Um, I am now ready to engage with your questions. I see people have been writing in the chat. So let me just open it and see whether there is any questions yet. And any Dr. Questions? Bunjiri, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to remove your spotlight. And if you, yeah. want, to uh, if you want to stop sharing your presentation, um, we can, you know, be a group in community so folks can yeah, op okay. open up and ask questions. That's okay, yeah. Awesome. All right, so let me go back to the gallery view. So we definitely welcome you to, to come off camera, to unmute, to connect with us and ask doc Dr. Gunjiri any of your questions that you may have about her presentation and the things that she shared with us today. Can you put your information in the chat? Okay. Your your um, contact information. Yes. And thank you. It was a great presentation. <laughs> I, I, I received some direction as the next steps for me to take. So thank you very much. And Brenda, Dr. Gunjiri will also share her presentation and I okay. will send that out to everyone so you all can, you know, have access to her slides. Oh, wonderful. As well as this recording. So if you want to go back okay. and listen to the things she shared, that'll be available mm -hmm. to you as well. Okay. Awesome. All right. Okay. So any questions? Yeah, question. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of window we have for leveraging our dissertation. Does it... Does it have to be done within a, a you know a year or six months in order for it to still be relevant, or do we have a, a window of opportunity that we can leverage? All right, so no, not six months. Um, publications don't even happen that quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Maggie and 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 um, Priscilla graduated in twenty thirteen. Uh, their books came out in 2015 and 2016. So that gives you an idea of 
you know, how long the process is. I mean, they presented papers at conferences and all that. I started publishing from my dissertation in 2005. So even before it was completed. Um, and the last thing I did that was directly related to my dissertation was, I want to say 2014 or 2012, 2012. Um, you know, there's parts of the data that don't necessarily age, you know, lessons learned don't age, um, stories don't age. So, and also that the last piece I wrote um, based on the dissertation was a reevaluation and reanalysis of some of the, the stories, right? Mm -hmm. Because the more I learned about the particular topic, which was about spirituality and leadership, the more I got in, engaged in working in that area of spirituality and leadership, the more I realized I had new terminologies and new concepts to use to explain, you know, some of what I had found in my study that I hadn't actually done in the dissertation itself. Um, so there's always, you can, you know, five to seven years, you can still be minting that thing for all it's worth. Um, and Obviously you want to do sooner rather than later, but like I just gave that example, I was able to just take what I was learning from all the, the you know, the, the, the field of spirituality and leadership grew a lot um, in the time after my, you know, my, I completed my work. Um, and so I was able to take those concepts that were coming up, the, 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 the operationalization of what it means to talk about, you know, spiritual leadership and reflect back on my data and be able to write something fresh from that. Um, but generally I would say three to five years would be about how long you can expect to be milking it. Once you write the book, um, most people will tell you, if you're going to be in academia, that you know, if you're going to go the tenure track uh, route that you should do the book last, you know, get all these, articles and book chapters and all these other and then come back and you know reconstruct the book um i'm of the opinion that do whatever works right the important thing is that you get that information out there you get that material out there and it also depends on your audience if you're writing for a practitioner audience it really makes sense to do the book early right because practitioner audiences are not going to be reading stuff behind a paywall of a, a academic journal if you're writing for an academic audience then it makes sense to focus on the articles first okay. thank you one of the things i really like that you shared because i am i am i don't work in academia i work in the corporate sector in business uh, but then i'm also you know pursuing my doctoral degree at eastern and teaching as an adjunct in the community college so i i kind of have my toe in academia but also in the corporate sector. And, and so in this journey, as I looked at other people presenting a timeline that was, you know, do the dissertation, do the, you know, publication, for me, that made sense in my mind if I was going to go end up trying to be a tenured professor in a higher education yeah. institution. But that may not be what I do. I may continue to be in the corporate sector. I may be a consultant one day and, and do something like what you're doing. I don't know. Yep. And so yep. when an opportunity to, to start engaging in publishing happened as in a group of women, you know, authoring a case study showed up, I, you know, was like, well, I'm supposed to be doing my homework and my coursework, but I'm going to take advantage of this because it helps me in my writing journey process. So when those opportunities have presented themselves, I've had that moment of deliberation, like, should I be doing this? I'm supposed to be really tunneled in on my dissertation. Is that a good idea? But then I step back and think, you know, is that, that's also a learning opportunity so that for example, you talked about it when I wrote the chapter for the book, it was on my dissertation topic and it mm -hmm. helped me explore other aspects that are now in my first three chapters as I'm continuing to write them. Yeah. So I'm really glad I did that. And I'm, I'm you know, glad for examples like yours that, sh that say it doesn't have to follow a linear path, right? And, and to yep. be open 
you know, to exploring and growing in that journey. So I really appreciate you talking about that because it's not necessarily a one size fits all formula for how we go about this process. Yeah, it shouldn't be a one size fits all um, because it really does, again, depend on the audience that you feel is your primary audience. It depends on um, the example I just gave about, you know, um, I get excited when I meet students who say they're, they're, my work has informed their work. The other part that is exciting for me in thinking through, you know, you know, cause publications have a life of their own, right? We don't always get to know um, who's reading our work, who's, especially if it's not citations. Citations are the traditional method of finding out who's reading your work, right? But that's not always the most effective method because the people reading our work might not be publishing in places that get cited. Um, but the idea that we produce knowledge so that, that that knowledge can be used, right? To improve lives, to improve leadership, to improve organizational you know, culture, to improve something. We don't do, in leadership, we don't do our research just for the sake of research. We do our research because there's a question we are asking that is of importance to us because of our prior experiences. And really we hope that whatever we find out is going to do something. It's going to have a life of, the, of its own. And so that for me is, is exciting. And I kept that throughout my, my program and throughout all my publishing. I still publish, even though I'm no longer full-time. Um, you know, that book that I mentioned on, um, that you mentioned in the bio, African Leadership, Powerful Paradigms for the 21st Century, just came out, you know, in March. Um, so I'm still writing, I'm still publishing. The reason being the audience for that book is African you know, managers, African students. And it's important to me to keep speaking to that audience, right? And that audience, their managers, the MBA students in, in business schools, in, in African institutions, are not very likely to be reading peer-reviewed journal articles in some high faluting management, you know, academy or management journal. But they're going to read that book. They're going to read things that they find on a blog. They're going to read things that they find on, in practitioner outlets. So keeping your audience in mind, keeping your purpose in mind is really important. You do what works for that audience, for you, for your purpose, for your higher purpose, not just what will reap rewards of tenure and promotion as the case might be. So anybody else with a question? I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. you, you basically answered part of that question because I was gonna ask you about identifying journal articles um, or journals, I'm sorry, that, would, mm -hmm. uh, that you would speak to. So basically, what is your audience? Who is your audience that you're writing to? And when I wrote my dissertation, my, my dissertation is um, basically it's a narrative paradigm um, I'm dealing, I focus on women in STEM and tech fields, and I, um, I elevated their stories during my mm -hmm. dissertation using a narrative uh, uh, theoretical framework. But I, I wanted to know, how did you identify the journals that would work for you off the back? I am working on attending conferences, but it seems like as soon as there's a conference, it's like, oh, you're, you're paper is due in like 15 days or 20. I'm like, I, I don't have that capacity <laughs> to submit in 15 days. So it's always a short turnaround, it feels like to me. So I, I wanted to know first, how do you identify the journals? And then also conferences um, with the short turnaround. Should I've already, I mean, coming from December till until now was four months since I've completed the dissertation and so my brain is smush it feels mm -hmm, like it at mm -hmm, least I'm so exhausted mm -hmm. but I'm ready to get back out there and push that dissertation because I believe that it's it's it, it speaks volumes to women of color mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. if you can help me with that because that's where I'm trying to align with what journals I should be pushing out to and what how quickly I should be going out for these conferences What's the title of your dissertation? It is a narrative paradigm of African American women and STEM IT fields. Oh, okay. I have, may I make one teensy comment before you share mm -hmm. your insight? 
Um, because you're, you're from STEM? <laughs> I, well, that is my background, but I, I wanted to give <laughs> kind of a shameless plug for, I know you're very involved with ILA and, and that that's really how I started my journey as well in terms of making those connections and networks. And um, I serve on the planning committee for the annual diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging virtual summit. And we have our call, call for proposals right now for that conference, which the you know topic of your dissertation research is relevant, of course, in that space and and also not something that everyone else is presenting on. So it would be you know a great unique contribution. It's obviously not a journal or a paper, but it is an opportunity for you to get in front of an audience of ILA members and even folks who are not in ILA to present on your topic to that group. And one of the things that Dr. Gunjiri mentioned about making connections that the first time I published came from the relationships in ILA in women in leadership, where we came together and you know were able to publish. And that was from going to ILA and meeting them. So it could mm -hmm. be an opportunity for you, yes, you know, to yes. network and meet folks. So I'm happy to share, share that. Um, Absolutely. Can you send you? me your contact information yes. as well? <laughs> yes. Perfect. So, sorry, your, uh, shameless recruiting plug. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was a perfect answer because <laughs> she needs to just find that first step. You know, the rest yes. of it opens, right? Way opens, but you got to find that first step. And ILA is always a wonderful first step because within ILA, we've got so many sub communities, right? So DEI is kind of a sub community because that's a conference a sub-conference of the, of the, you know, apart from the main one. Um, eventually, you might find there, there might even be a group there that either does STEM, right, mm -hmm. or does IT. Because, again, these both of those topics right there um, are hot topics, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. One of my former students from Indiana College of Technology, um, Indiana Tech, did a dissertation on uh, African women um, leading in within this, the the IT um, industries, right? So they're um, in senior leadership in IBM Africa or Google Africa or you know those kinds of organizations. Um, and ILA has been a great home for her um, and, and and her work. So I definitely recommend that um, as a um, as your first step in finding the right communities to belong to. Thank you. Thank you. And Karen, I have your information as well. I do have a, a second question here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, and forgive me, this comes out of uh, lack of knowledge here. Um, so I, I, I submitted my dissertation as normal to ProQuest and then to the Library of Congress. How would that work when would I, when I'm submitting to journals or using my work, how do I reuse the work that I've submitted to the Library of Congress and ProQuest? You retain copyright. Okay. You retain copyright. So the work is still yours. You're able to, to um, reuse it um, because yeah, you're still the copyright holder. Um, so you can break it up as much as you want to break it up. And, you know, if, um, if you're writing for a journal that requires that you say where your work has previously been published, then you would do that. But really, for ProQuest and, and um, the copyright issues, you don't really have to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, it's still very much your work. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Where did you do your uh, doctoral program? Regent University in okay. Virginia, yes. Okay. So it looks like right. we have time for maybe one more question. One. <laughs> if anyone has one last question for Dr. Gunjeri. It's one, it's almost 1 a.m. here. So I'm going yeah. to start talking hogwash, you know. Just... <laughs> <laughs> and well, you know what? Let's take let's take that la this last minute. Do you want to tell folks about the coaching, you know, work that you do? And sure. just for everyone, um, I'll share that information in the follow-up as well, so that if you want to engage with Dr. Gunjeri around that, you'll have that information from her. But yes, let, let her in know about that. 
Yeah, so the last slide I added some information about the fact that I do do dissertation coaching, but I do dissertation coaching, I do publication coaching. Um, I've worked with lots and lots and lots of people over the years in um, when we were doing those books for ILA, it was a very developmental process, right? So um, I am highly experienced in helping people turn the gem of an idea into something actually publishable. So if you want that kind of extra um, help or you just want someone you can brainstorm with once in a while, I'm a coach, I'll be happy to. Awesome. And, and I'll include that in the information with, uh, with her slides. And on just one last quick note with our, our last minute, Dr. Uh, Dr. Hernandez was not able to be here with us today, but I did want to give a call out and thank you to her. The Thriving the Dissertation we webinar series is, um, is her brainchild. And um, she proudly brings this together as an opportunity to have these kinds of conversations that are so meaningful. And if you're not, I know, um, one of our folks here is from our Eastern program, but if you're not part of our Eastern University doctoral program in, in organizational leadership, she's our East, she is our interim chair of the program um, and is the founder of this series. So we're glad that you're here with us. If you joined us through our Facebook group, I'll also be posting this information in there as well. And um, we just want to thank you for being here with us and for taking the time to connect. We want to thank Dr. Gunjiri for your insights and for sharing with us. We really, really appreciate you so, so much, especially um, being with us from so far away and so late at night. <laughs> so this is all mine. <laughs> really. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then look for more information uh, on our next events. And with that, we wish you a blessed rest of your day. Bye from Africa. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank